Hello and welcome. My name is Fabi Gigi. I'm the chair of the Japan Research Center, as you all know. It's great to see you here in the post um, reading week blues. I think there's sort of a, an interesting temporality. We have more people in attendance online than we actually have in the room. But I also know that some of the classes are running all the way up to five o'clock. So we hope that a few more people um, will come in, like right about now. Or did they go to the other side? <laughs> Apologies for that. Right, so it is my pleasure to introduce the speaker for tonight, who flew in specifically this morning um, from Budapest. Uh, Geregli Tot is a Hungarian independent Japanese studies researcher. Uh, he received his MA in Japanese studies from Gaspar Karoli University of the Reformed Church in Budapest in Hungary. He also spent two years, as I can't you say, under a Mombusho scholarship at Vasada University, where he studied international relations at the Graduate School of Asia Pacific Studies, a school that we are very familiar here and that we have very close um, ties with. His interdisciplinary research revolves around the history of relations between Hungary and the Austro-Hungarian monarchy and the Meiji and Taisho era in Japan. He's also interested in the perceptions about Japan in Europe and is currently working on the reevaluation, demystification, objectivation, and of early and contemporary European, Japanese, and Hungaro Japanese relations. So please welcome with me uh, Dr. Uh, Gergely Tot to the SOAS JRC Wednesday seminar. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here. So let's start because I don't really have a lot of time. So, and I would like to talk uh, about a lot of uh, stuff here. First, I have a question for you. Uh, did you know that if you search Google for the term Japanology, this gentleman is going to come up in the top 10 search results uh, for those who, don't, who, who are not familiar with uh, this gentleman. His name is Peter Berkan. Uh, he's a British broadcaster slash accidental ambassador extraordinaire uh, with a blend of Anglo-Burmese uh, background. Uh, you may know him as the host of the NHK's uh, Begin Japanology and Japanology Plus. Uh, he is the British face of Japanese culture on the NHK programs and lately on social media. Uh, Mr. Barakan stumbled into Japanese studies at, here at SOAS, uh, much like people stumble into a restaurant without actually knowing what's on the menu, <laughs> I guess. Um, and um, yes, I'm speaking of, of stumbling, <laughs> I didn't know that there's, there's a, a British alcoholic beverage called Japanology. Isn't that fascinating? Why? <laughs> um, I, mean, I think it's a perfect pair or match and uh, pairing with uh, with Peter Barakan's shows. But uh, before we get high on our consumer culture intake, let's take a, let's take a few steps back and uh, look at how the discipline of the real uh, Japanology started and evolved something uh, bigger than itself. Okay, so uh, here you can see the main uh, themes uh, and uh, subjects I'm going to talk about. And let's uh, start with the very brief history. So Japanology traces its origins uh, to the broader field of Oriental studies in Europe, uh, which initially emerged uh, from biblical scholarship uh, focused uh, on the Middle East. As the geographical and academic interest gradually shifted eastward, uh, Sinology was established first, uh, with Japanology eventually developing on the fringes of Sinology as a kind of spin-off. Uh, Holland was the first European country where academic interest in Japan received attention in 1855. Uh, Holland was also the only European country to maintain trade relations with Japan during its period of isolation, and Leiden University was the first to establish a program in Japanology. The first professional chair in Japanology at Leiden, uh, held by Johann Josef Hoffmann, 
was originally intended to cover both Chinese and Japanese studies. Following Holland, France took an interest in 1868, followed by England and Germany in the 1870s. The first International Congress of Orientalists, held in Paris in September 1873, marked a pivotal moment in the development of Oriental and Japanese studies. The conference, led by French scholar Léon de Rosny, a pioneer in Japanology, featured Japan as a central theme. Uniquely, the International Congress of Orientalists initially targeted industrialists, merchants, and diplomats. Uh, in contrast to later congresses, that would focus more on academic disciplines. A major accomplishment of this inaugural International Congress of Orientalists was the creation of transcription systems for Japanese and other non-Western languages using Roman alphabets. Uh, the conference uh, centered on four main objectives, all related to Japan's relationship with the West. The first was the establishment of Japanese transcription with Western characters. The second was a comparison of civilizations between Japan and the West. Uh, the third was a comparison of scientific achievements. Uh, and uh, fourth was fostering cooperation between Japanese and Western scientists. The 1873 Congress set the stage uh, for further connections, such as a meeting in London in 1891, where author Diosi, in Hungarian, Artur Diosi, uh, proposed the formation uh, of a society to promote Japanese studies, which later led to the establishment of the Japan Society in London. Arthur, da Arthur Diyoshi's father, Marton Diyoshi, served as a secretary to Lajos or Louis Kossuth, uh, the Hungarian politician who was a region president of Hungary during uh, 1849 and, uh, 48 and 49 revolution. After the defeat uh, in the War of Independence, Marton emigrated to London from Hungary. His son Arthur developed an interest in Asia during his student years, and although, although Arthur never visited Hungary, he spoke Hungarian fluently alongside with Japanese, French, Spanish, German, Italian, and he was also fluent in Flemish and Portuguese. In Germany, the Seminar of, uh, for Oriental Languages was established in 1887 at Friedrich Wilhelm University in Berlin. This institution played a key role in shaping the careers of later Japanologists, Although uh, its primary focus was on language instruction, it also incorporated elements of Landeskunde, which today could be described as the content in area studies. The first professor at the, the institution was Inoue Tetsujiro, uh, one of Japan's leading nationalist ideologues during that period. The first autonomous chair in Japanology at the German university was established at Universität Hamburg, in 1914, uh, sorry, 1914, with Karl Florenz, a former professor at the Imperial University in Tokyo, appointed to the position. In parallel to Japanology, uh, there was a term called Yamatology. Uh, the term emerged in Europe in the late uh, 19th century to describe the study of Japanese history and culture. Interestingly, while Yamatology faded in most uh, countries before the World War I, it remained popular in Italy as a synonym uh, for Japanology, particularly uh, in the 1930s. Italian scholars still occasionally use it today, though the term carries obvious political ideological connotations and undertones. Uh, rooted in the ancient name of for Japan, Yamato, it, evo it evokes uh, concepts of the Yamato race and spirit, emphasizing Japan's perceived timeless essence. The interwar era uh, brought significant developments in Japanese studies in Europe. In 1926, uh, the Maison Franco-Japonaise was established in Tokyo. Modern Japanese literature was translated by the first resident scholars, uh, while research in Japanese uh, folklore, ethnology, archaeology was also conducted. In Germany, the 1933-1945 period was influenced by uh, ideological propaganda and Japanology was exploited by the National Socialists for political purposes, 
uh, particularly to support the highly favored Berlin-Tokyo axis. The Nazi shift in Japanese studies brought politically driven individuals unprecedented opportunities to insert themselves into Japan-related affairs. Some scholars managed to avoid uh, the ideological trap during 1933 and 1945 by retreating into philological translations. In 1935, German Japanology had three professor professorships located in Hamburg, Leipzig, and Berlin. Beyond the universities, uh, however, many interest clubs in Germany uh, also shaped German-Japanese relations. Uh, due to the Weimar Republic's uh, multiple crises, the state could not pursue robust diplomacy with Japan, leaving a void that German civil society, uh, often with significant support from the Japanese, filled by managing relations through these associations. As German society became Nazified, leadership roles were increasingly filled by unqualified individuals, uh, and knowledge of Japan was politicized, and dogmatism and party loyalty was prioritized. In Britain, the network of Japanese studies scholar, scholars grew, with notable figures such as Sir Hugh Cortazzi and Sir Peter Parker. In Austria, the Japanology department remained one of the most influential departments at the University of Vienna. Uh, Japanese, uh, Japanology in Austria continued to develop uh, within the framework of ethnology with a strong anthropological focus uh, supported by fieldwork in Japan and close contacts with Japanese institutions. The Japanology Institute in Vienna also had a patron financier from 1938 Baron Takaru Mitsui. The Japanese industrialists acting on behalf of the Japanese foreign ministry, <coughs> sorry, approached countries friendly to Japan to promote uh, Japan-focused research in Vienna, Prague, and Rome. In the Soviet Union, scholarship was heavily influenced by Marxism. In Czechoslovakia, there was a strong focus of, on linguistics in Japanology, and in the USA, the study of Japan during the pre-war and immediate post-war periods was first driven by the need to understand the enemy and later by the goal of securing Japan as a reliable ally. World War II interrupted Japanology in all European countries and it was not until the 1950s and later then Japanology was re-established at the universities but with little changes in approach and outlook. The focus on Japanology rested uh, on language, linguistics, and translations of mainly medieval and modern literature. In the 1960s, uh, two major directives uh, inspired and guided European studies of Japan, particularly in the field of fields of cultural and social disciplines. One emphasized the necessity of a dual approach combining Japanology with, with, with another discipline and encouraging collaboration with neighboring fields. Uh, the, the other directive uh, stressed the importance of a thorough command of Japanese sources, research, and orientations. Since the 1970s, there have been continuous efforts, but with limited success, to transform Japanology this exotic and eccentric field modeled after disciplines like Egyptology or Assyriology into uh, a more open and modern uh, social science oriented realm of Japanese studies. During this period, three stages were formulated to address uh, the impossible expectation that Japanologists know everything about Japan. The first was to narrowly define, narrowly define Japanology as the study of language and literature. The second was to position Japanology as an auxiliary discipline with Japanologists serving as purveyors of specialized knowledge to other fields. The third thought was to abandon Japanology altogether in favor of Japan or ja mainly Japanese studies. Uh, the latter is usually understood as a discipline that covers sociology, social and cultural anthropology, the social psychology, um, political science, and economics. Ultimately, while uh, Japanese studies gained prominence in Europe by the 2020s, 
Japanology was not entirely discarded. Some even distinguished between two different traditions regarding the focal origin of Japanese studies. The philological focus can be attributed to mainly to Europe, while the social science orientation is mainly linked to the USA, according to some. Uh, there was a strong knowledge base of the Japanese language in Europe, uh, which led to the publication of dictionaries, uh, grammar books, uh, bibliographies. Uh, this provided fertile ground for translations, textual interpretations, and various compilations on history, literature, religion, and more, eventually uh, expanding into the social sciences and other fields. In 1980, Jerzy Václav Neustupny, a Czech-Austrian linguist and professor at uh, Monash University, was a key figure in Japanology and so sociolinguistics, uh, introduced uh, the concept of shifting paradigms between Japanology and Japanese studies. He described the Japanology paradigm as uh, one that emerged when the study of Japan was largely free from in instrumental motivations, such as economic, political, or especially military interests. During this time, the primary focus on areas like philology, pre-modern history, religion, and ethnography. Only a small group of scholars were engaged in the field uh, with their attention directed towards exotic and oriental societies and cultures. Specialization occurred more along regional lines uh, than disciplinary ones. Uh, the other concept, the Japanese studies paradigm, emerged as Japan's growing international significance made the study of Japan increasingly instrumental, both within and outside of academia. Research in Japanese studies became more valuable and relevant to fields such as politics, social policies, and economics. Specialization shifted uh, further towards uh, various disciplines such as history and sociology, with a growing number of scholars entering the field. According to Neustupny, the Japanese studies paradigm was characterized by a generally positive view of Japan and was heavily influenced by Nihon Jinron theories, which were widely accepted both in academic circles and public, uh, in the public sphere. Nihon Jinron means uh, the uh, discourses on the Japanese, uh, and it can be understood as like a genre of uh, domestic Japanese self-portrayal, uh, spanning everyday, even academic and mass market publications. Uh, popular works uh, assert with numbing repetition that uh, the uniqueness of Japan uh, constituted as the particularized obverse of the West. However, Japanology standing within academic circles was not particularly high with the exception of its philological uh, recognition. Japanology courses in Hungarian universities in the 1990s were characterized ironically with the term in English, uh, cloakroom buffet course, which probably in the British equivalent is probably Mickey Mouse course, is that right? Yeah. Um, buffet, for those who, who know Hungarian. Uh, Despite some encouraging trends, many problems uh, uh, remain in relation to Japanology and Japanese studies. Uh, first, Japan is so exoticized and supposedly irrelevant to the thoroughly Eurocentric university establishment that state support for Japanology or and Japanese studies is quite limited. Second, while all kinds of academic disciplines come together uh, under the umbrella term uh, Japanology and Japanese studies, there's a considerable gap between these general disciplines uh, with their various theories and methodologies and the low interest in applying and unifying these methods in Japanese studies. Uh, by the same token, scholars of Japan uh, have not been able to make an impact on the Eurocentrality of the general disciplines. Third, the lack of communication among scholars within and among European uh, countries, as well as with their American counterparts, is only slowly being alleviated. There are additional inherent issues in Japanology and in Japanese studies, as Ike P. Rotz aptly described it in 19, uh, 2019, sorry, quote, in Japanese studies, Japan is a given. Institutionally speaking, 
Japanese studies is a well-established academic discipline with its own journals and international associations and study programs at major universities worldwide. Unlike most other academic disciplines, however, it is defined neither by a scientific method nor a body of theory, but only by its subject matter, things Japanese. Haiku poetry, Shingon cosmology, LDP ideology, and Studio Ghibli imagery have nothing in common, cannot be interpreted through the same theoretical lens, and are approached by means of different methodological uh, toolkits. Yet, they are all studied at Japanese, uni uh, Japanese studies uh, departments, which persist not because of the innovative character of societal relevance of their research, but more prosaically because of comparatively high student numbers and a stable supply of Japanese funding. Japanese studies continues to exist as a bounded academic field, but it is characterized by a high degree of self-containment and isolation and little productive interaction with other disciplines, unquote. So these were Ike P. Roth's uh, words. So drawing on the observation of other scholars, Aviad Iraz offered uh, an insightful explanation on the role of Japanologists and Japan experts back in 2013. According to this view, Japanologists, quote, all too readily assemble among themselves as Japan specialists, rather than as members of distinct intellectual constituencies, unquote. They are caught in a dual role. Uh, on the one hand, uh, they are interpreters of the secrets of the Japanese essence, while on the other, they are committed to preserving the mystery of Japan. This is because Japanology has been largely shaped by the search for the ultimate signifier, the Japanese spirit and its national character. Uh, consequently, uh, Japanologists reinforced the stereotypical image of Japan by preserving Japanology's paradigmatic approach, myths, and oriental perspectives. According to Keizo Nagatani and Akio Tanaka, uh, the historiography of, historiography of image building between Japan and the West, the images they hold of each other have largely remained unchanged. This situation can be partly attributed to the presence of Japanology. Along with journalists and politicians, the chief culprits who are responsible for perpetuating static images of Japan, there are academics who, or who unintentionally or otherwise, propagate the canonical observations of early Japanologists that Japan is fundamentally an antithesis of Western civilization. So in, the, in these orient, Orientalist contributions of Japanology with the help of journalism and uh, politis, politics, Japan is attributed with qualities that are diametrically opposite of what supposedly characterized the West. While the, while the West is conceived as muscular, rational, progressive, Japan remained feminine, emotional, and backward. Moreover, there's an ironic twist to this, since the characterization of Japan was not just a product of a one-way, single-minded European imposition. The Japanologist discourse, discourse had complicit partners uh, in Japan, too, who were eager to share their views on Japanese uniqueness. When one looks for a defense from uh, Japanologists against accusations leveled at their field, one may come across uh, the thoughts of Jeffrey Bonas from 1966, quote, uh, let me try to delimit what I understand, understand by the term Japanology. The word implies a sweep of studies, at times almost pretentious in its breadth. It includes every aspect of Japan, its people, its history, its literature, its language, uh, its religions, thought, art, and the rest. It is inward looking, a discipline to itself, broad based and self contained, gathering under its wing every chicken in a numerous brood of studies. It has driven off the inquisitive outsider with its difficult demands and its often unnecessary exoticism. But whatever its effects, I would not put into disrepute either the study itself or its exponents. In its time and of its day, Japanology was the best. In fact, the only possible form of study of Japan. And to decry Japanology would be to discard a corpus of material often still of great value 
as an essential basis for specialized study. In, the, in its worst manifestations, it is somewhat a little amateurish. Often it, had been, uh, it has been uh, Western-centered, and at its worst, Japanology rejects every Western prejudice or value into its interpretations. It looks in on and down on with the eyes of the outsider, and in those eyes, it is often hard to discern even the faintest glimmer of Nipponese knowledge or the inside born of sympathy. But at its best, based on a thorough knowledge of the language and original sources, Japanology has everything to teach us. The names of Sato, Alcock, Aston, Gubbins, Brinkley, Dickens, Mitford, and Chamberlain, the first generation of Japanologists, are not yet, nor should they be, forgotten. As scholar pioneers, the Japanologists gained a deserved reputation from the Japanese. Uh, by about the end of the 19th century, Japanese scholarship was beginning to develop soundly on a modern scientific basis, unquote. And we also have uh, the most up-to-date modern definition of Japanese studies, which was provided by uh, Ogawa and Seton uh, back in 2020. Uh, it goes like this, uh, the interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary study of Japan in the social sciences and humanities in which analysis of Japan in domestic, international, or comparative contexts using both Japanese and non-Japanese sources is disseminated to an international audience. Uh, Ogawa and Seton conceptualized six uh, different eras of Japanese studies. The first was the early imperial uh, up to 1905, the Russo-Japanese War. Uh, the second was the late imperial uh, up to 1945. Uh, then after that came the era, the post-war era, uh, to 1960s, and then the internationalization came from the 1970s up to the 1980s, uh, then came the globalization from 1990s up to the 1910s, and it seems like we are living in the era of uh, the new frontiers from 2020 onward. Uh, in the second part, uh, I would like to present 14 points of criticism coming from a Dutch sinologist, Hans Kuiper. Although these criticisms are quite generic, targeting the whole area studies field, these can be applicable to Japanese studies at some points as well. So the first uh, criticism of Hans Kuiper is that country experts trespass on fields uh, of study belonging to social or other sciences with which should not be tolerated. Uh, my personal view uh, is that such an accusatory tone is quite counterproductive, uh, but uh, interdisciplinary should be encouraged and not polished. Criticism number two, a country expert must have broad, deep and organized knowledge in a specific field and area studies lack this. Number three, Country experts need well-organized knowledge in multiple disciplines, otherwise uh, the, the limits of their knowledge, otherwise uh, they are merely repositories of uh, discrete facts. Uh, criticism number four, area experts should acknowledge uh, the limits of their knowledge uh, to avoid overstepping their expertise. Uh, I agree with this claim personally. Uh, acknowledging boundaries is ethical and can prevent uh, the imposter syndrome and Dunning-Kruger effect as well. So transparency about one's expertise uh, uh, is uh, quite uh, vital uh, uh, for maintaining academic integrity. Uh, criticism number five, scientific collaboration is required to comprehend the complexity of a country. Criticism number six, Country experts lack deep knowledge uh, in any discipline and are prone to escapism and obscurantism. Criticism number seven, fluency in a country's language does not equate uh, to scientific mastery. And indeed, personally, I think uh, language skills are alone, uh, alone uh, do not qualify one as, as a country expert, but language fluency is important, uh, but it's insufficient without a strong disciplinary foundation. 
uh, for a defense of Japanese studies. In this regard, Alan Tansman argues that, quote, if area studies can be understood uh, as an enterprise seeking to know, analyze, and in interpret foreign cultures through a multidisciplinary lens, translation may be the act par excellence of area studies. Unquote. Uh, let's move on to criticism number eight. Expertise can be measured by familiarity uh, with quantitative reasoning, mixed methods, and theoretical frameworks. Number nine, the lack of a tested country theory makes country studies fundamentally flawed and disqualifies area studies experts from being considered true scientists. Quite harsh words. Um, criticism number 10, country experts are unreliable without citing their disciplinary sources and borrowed theories. Number 11, area experts often fail to reference basic works from other disciplines. Criticism number 12, area studies lack defining scientific models and analytical points of view. Number 13, uh, without inter interdisciplinary collaboration, Area studies uh, should be removed from higher education curricula. In my personal opinion, uh, removing area studies from universities is absolutely unrealistic. Uh, and this, uh, this attitude towards area studies and those active in the field uh, is probably, probably rather counterproductive. But actually, this is happening sometimes at, at some universities, because I think the latest news from Leiden University is that they would, uh, it was framed as axing Japanese studies, but basically what's happening at Leiden at the moment is that they merging Japanese studies with Korean studies and Chinese studies. But definitely there will be budget cuts and, uh, and probably professors will lose their job. Okay, so the last uh, one, uh, criticism number 14, Japanese studies lacks a, a distinctive explanatory framework, reducing its scientific legitimacy. Without a distinctive expl explanatory framework of, or theory, Japanologists are not true scientists, according to uh, Hans Kuiper. So throughout these claims, uh, the primary concerns it seems that it revolves around the perceived lack of a structured explanatory framework in area studies and the resultant impact on their scientific legitimacy. While I personally uh, find some criticism quite valid, others reflect an elitist or probably paternalistic stance from traditional scientific uh, disciplines, emphasizing interdisciplinarity, uh, collaboration, transparency, and the development of uh, rigorous uh, theoretical and ethical frameworks can address many of these concerns, uh, fostering a more inclusive and dynamic academic uh, environment. So if you move on uh, to the critical voices about Japanese studies specifically, the claims with which I fully agree with can be summarized uh, in four main points. Sorry. according to Ioannis Gaitanidis. Number one, uh, nation centrism that risks a, politi a politically equaling nation to culture. Number two, an area focus that ignores the contingency of geographical units within global flows of communication and movement. movement. Uh, number three is a scholarly short-sightedness uh, that employs theory to explain out uh, its object of study and not the opposite. Number four was a serious positionality, positionality program which effaces local perspectives. Uh, and there's another thing I think we need to talk about. Um, there's a discernible presence of explicit or implicit Japanophilia in specific circles of Western scholars engaged with Japan, including some Japanologists, sociologists, art historians, linguists, anthropologists, geographers, historians. Uh, among some of these academics, uh, certain individuals uh, exhibit a tendency and susceptibility to depict Japan only in a favorable light. 
Um, uh, subconscious motivations may also underlie their, their inclinations. Those desiring uh, invitations to work in Japan may feel compelled to showcase their research positively uh, in front of their Japanese colleagues. Uh, when it comes to conducting ethical and objective, hereby I mean non japanophile research in Japan, unfortunately, very few scholars think like Clemens Senica a Slovenian scholar from the Department of Ethnology and Cultural Anthropology, Ljubljana. Uh, Seneca writes the following, a quote, no one wants his or her article or monograph to be seen as sliding into the so-called Nihonjinron ideology. However, it seems that English language studies on Japanese colonialism are prone to certain Shin Nihonjinron, unquote. Even few scholars are conscious of the need to be cautious in scholarly interpretations about things Japanese, like Robert Thomas Tierney, an American professor in the East Asian Languages and Cultures Department at the University of Illinois. In one of his books, uh, Tierney uh, aptly addresses this responsibility, quote, in this book, I attempt to navigate between the Sulla of making a fetish of Japan's uniqueness and the Charybdis of reducing it to an application of a universal role, unquote. Self-reflectiveness is emerging among Japanologists too. As Marilyn Ivey writes, quote, Japanology is something to question. Uh, I always resist being primarily identified as a Japanologist rather than an anthropologist, despite the problems inherent uh, in that uh, disciplinary identification, because of its Orientalist associations and its constructed purview." Unquote. Harumi Befu, a professor emeritus of anthropology and the pioneer of Japanese studies, who challenged and exposed uh, stereotypes about Japanese people and their culture, held the following opinion about uh, certain Western scholars researching Japan, quote, Western scholars are predisposed to see Japan through uh, rosy glasses, uh, making them susceptible to accepting a model that depicts Japan in a favorable light from the standpoint of Western values. At a deeper, unconscious level, anyone, especially if he has to deal with Japanese closely and has the, to return to Japan for professional reasons, uh, would want his Japanese colleagues to think well of him. One who propounds a model depicting Japan as a well-integrated, harmonious, and so on, is more uh, likely to be well-received than one whose model presents Japan in an unfavorable light. Thus, there is a subconscious motivation uh, to accept the official ideology as the theoretical model. At still another, uh, another level of analysis, those who study Japan tend to be like Japanese in their personality disposition. As Japanese are concerned with harmonious relations, Westerners, including Japan, also tend to have the personality disposition that accepts the same ideology." Unquote. So from the early 1990s, numerous scholars, including Harmi Befu himself, began to uh, turning their attention to the inher inherent uh, Japanophilia in Japanese studies uh, and sought to expose the lack of self-reflexivity in the field. They strongly opposed the self-congratulatory and self-loading uh, attitudes prevalent in Japanese studies as well, revealing the Japanophile approach embedded within the discipline. One of their main arguments was that proponents of Japanese studies were primarily focusing, focused on securing research funding rather than contributing to an objective scientific understanding of Japan or the Japanese society or things Japanese. So what is the current situation with Japanese studies around the world? Uh, I will be using a survey from 2020, so things might have changed uh, here and there, but basically I think the, the basis uh, is still true. So um, the number of Japanese uh, number of students in the field of Japanology uh, is on the rise. For example, in Hungary, in the country I'm coming from, as a result, Hungarian universities are tailoring their Japanology or Japanese studies programs to prospective students. 
albeit uh, with an unfavorable consequence of VEB or Japanophile incubation. A VEB is a term uh, widely used in social media and in internet-based uh, discourses, both as a derogatory term and for, for in-group self-identification for a non-Japanese person who is so obsessed with Japanese culture that they wish they were actually Japanese. Uh, all of this is due to the unden undeniable fact uh, that the majority of applicants in Hungary are passionate and conditioned Japanophiles and ardent consumers of Japanese or other East uh, Asian pop culture. Uh, by enticing these young students into Japanese or East Asian, Asian studies programs, Hungarian universities uh, can significantly bolster their uh, income. This has led Hungarian Japanology departments to adopt the so-called customer service model, where both students and the foreign government-related institutions providing support are treated as customers. In this model, the customers must get, be kept amused and happy uh, for the univers university to profit. However, this shift brings inevitable consequences. Uh, it signals the decline. I think it signals the decline of universities or at least the stupor of their financially successful limbs. I mean, the Jap Japanese, the Korean, and the Chinese studies uh, departments in Hungary. As a result, uh, this leads to a serious degradation of incentives to prioritize academic accuracy, reason, critical inquiry, and academic freedom. As for the US, enrollment in various Japanese language source, uh, courses at universities is quite popular. And it looks like in recent years, more American students are learning Japanese than Chinese and Korean combined. However, the situation regarding the level of popularity of Japanese studies may, might be a different story in the States. Some say that the field is declining as a subject in tandem with the downturn in the Japanese economy. In a panel titled The Death of Japanese Studies at the 2019 Association of Asian Studies meeting in Denver, Colorado, a discussion was held on shrinking departments, the lack of tenure track lines, reduced interest in the Japanese language, and the competition from Chinese and Korean studies. So if you take a look uh, at the situation in Australia, Japanese language and culture courses were offered in more than 20 universities in 2020, and the past 20 years have seen stability in terms of growing enrollments in Japanese language and culture courses. However, there's an imbalance between the high number of students taking one or two Japanese language courses uh, and, uh, and the relatively low number of students doing a full major in Australia. In contrast, the situation in, uh, of Japanese studies in the UK, according to this uh, survey, is quite strong uh, or was quite strong in 2020 uh, or up to 2020 uh, relative to a lot of other European countries and to the US. In terms of undergraduate student numbers, there are about 500 students that start a BA course involving some Japan related elements in the UK every year, uh, whether as a major or some kind of minor element. And that number has stayed fairly strong. However, it seems that the shape of Japanese studies in the UK is similarly changing. One example is the decline uh, in the number of Japan study centers in the UK universities. According, uh, another noteworthy change is that the number of master's students has begun to steadily decline. I don't know what the situation at the moment is, and I would like to ask you, uh, what is your opinion on this later on? So uh, in Germany, uh, the interest in Japan as a subject of research is very strong, but at the same time, Japanese studies have taken a different form from previous area studies. Uh, rather, rather than Japan itself being the sole focus of study, the country is treated as a case study uh, and research is conducted, including an Asia-focused transnational perspective where Japan studies centers are integrated into bigger uh, Asia-focused uh, departments. In Spain, Japanese studies began with a delay, but over the past three decades, it, was, uh, it has made significant progress within uh, universities. Presently, eight universities provide programs focused on East Asian studies including Japanese studies, with an equivalent number 
uh, engaged in research projects. The field has extended uh, its research, its, its reach uh, from humanities to social sciences, spanning various research groups, centers, and universities. Nevertheless, the sustainability of Japanese studies faces challenges uh, due to concerns about institutional support and funding in the future, especially in Spain. The next, uh, I'm going to uh, talk about uh, the gender parity or the lack of it in Hungary, in current uh, Hungary. I tried to find uh, similar surveys or statistics. I couldn't really. So that's why I'm just talking about Hungary. And you can compare it with the situation in the UK or in, the, in your country. Um, there is an intriguing characteristic regarding the lack of gender parity in Japanology in my home country, Hungary, from its inception in 1986. It has developed into a discipline predominantly cultivate, cultivated by women. I have conducted a, it is just a quick non-representative sampling to investigate whether women are more active in academic fields related to Japan in Hungary. Uh, the results of this mini statistics uh, anal uh, analysis are as follows. 56% of online academic lectures at the Japan Foundation Budapest were del delivered by women between 2020 and 2021. The heads of Japanology departments uh, in 2021, uh, both of them were women. Uh, among lecturers in Hungarian universities in Japanology departments, 58% uh, were women in 2021. At uh, one of the biggest uh, Japanologist conference held in 2019, 65% of uh, Japanologist speakers were women. And in uh, one Hungarian university's Japanology program, 75% of graduates were women between 2000 and 2020. So in terms of women graduates, this can be partly explained uh, by a growing gender parity in the EU uh, in academic fields, as indicated by the EU's official She Figures report from 2021. However, it might be not coincidental that during a recent online talk in 2023, April, Dairon Dabney, uh, an, associ an associ associate professor of politics and Japanese studies at Earlham College, USA, expressed an opinion about Japanese studies contending that, quote, the field is largely white and largely female, unquote. On the other side uh, of this debate, American Japanese studies scholar Grace N. Yi Ting uh, is of is on the, uh, of the opinion, without actually citing any statistical data, that the field of Japanese studies in America is predominantly white and male. It is interesting to observe how personal experiences and perceptions about the gender situation in Japanese studies in America differ from person to person. Uh, perhaps we can attribute this difference in perceptions and experiences to innate male or female shawanis, but uh, Grace N. Yi Ting also expressed her opinion about Japanese studies, noting that individuals of color, uh, particularly those who are non-Japanese and or non-Asian, and queer individuals, especially those who are not gay white men, are still few and far between. Subsequently, uh, she asserts that the establishment of Japanology was influenced uh, in, in the USA was influenced by racialized and gendered forms of desire. She cites Harry Heratunian, uh, who highlighted that early male and presumably often white scholars of Japan studies were, quote, motivated by the desire to gain entry in order to penetrate and thus comprehend the concealed secrets of native knowledge and sensibility, unquote. And that it was frequently achieved by having Japanese wives who could also serve as native informants. Other scholars have made similarly interesting observations. They have uh, briefly commented on the history of uh, feminized role of Japanese language instructors, noting that Japanese language instruction has predominantly been a task undertaken by mostly Japanese women, as opposed to the more elite task of teaching, of teaching content courses of Japan. And according to them, it looks like this dynamic uh, still continues in the present. This part, uh, I'm going to talk about and share a few examples of both effective 
and problematic practices uh, where Japanese studies played a significant role. First of all, let's not forget the historic first ever retraction of peer-reviewed academic research paper in Japanese studies in 2020, 2022, sorry. Well, at least the author and the peer reviewers uh, called it research, most probably everyone else called it uh, too much information. One significant moment in this regard uh, was the Kimono Wednesday protests uh, that took place in 2015 uh, at the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. Protesters, primarily Asian Americans, and among them, Japanese studies scholars objected to the museum's event, which invited attendees to try on a replica. That was a beautiful replica, kimono replica, inspired by Claude Monet, uh, Monet's painting, La Japonaise. Uh, they argued that the event was an act of cultural appropriation and Orientalism, reducing Japanese culture to an exotic spectacle and reinforcing harmful stereotypes associated with racial discrimination against Asian Americans. However, in a brilliant argumentation, Julie Falk, a researcher affiliated with uh, the University of Oxford, analyzed uh, these protests and suggested that the protesters may have missed uh, an essential point by disregarding the nuanced nature of cultural exchange. The event had been a collaborative effort uh, with Japanese institutions and many Japanese and Japanese American did not actually find uh, the event offensive. Falk argues that by focusing on an American centric racial framework, the protesters overlooked the broader context of cultural exchange, unintentionally silencing Japanese voices. The third case uh, I'm going to talk about highlights the integrity crisis that affects contemporary scientific fields, including the humanities and Japan-related studies. It illustrates how political, economic, and institutional pressures can sometimes compromise both scientific and personal integrity. At the same time, however, it demonstrates the rebalancing influence that Japanese studies can potentially exert on these issues. In December 2020, J. Mark Ramseyer, a Mitsubishi professor of Japanese legal studies at Harvard University, uh, published a paper claiming that World War II comfort women, primarily Korean and other Asian women, entered contracts freely and with, with pri private operators of Japanese military-run comfort stations. This view drew sharp criticism, especially from Korean and other international scholars and advocacy groups who argued it uh, ignored historical exploitation and coerced labor. Supporters, including some conservative Korean groups, defended Ramseyer's right to publish, framing a position as a free speech issue. The, the debate underscores tensions between uh, historical interpretations uh, and freedom of academic in, uh, expression, and uh, his academic misconduct was characterized as a severe breach of academic standards. In her study, Be Beautiful and Brilliant Study Aid, Tessa Mori Suzuki, an Australian historian of modern Japan, uh, criticized uh, Ramseyer's article, highlighting multiple flaws in its research integrity. She questioned Ramseyer's use of sources, noting that he often omits evidence uh, that contradicts his claims and misrepresents data, casting doubt on his conclusions about World War II comfort women. Uh, Tessamori Suzuki emphasized that his uh, interpretation lacks a foundation in historical documentation, particularly since he fails to provide actual uh, contract evidence and neglects testimonies showing that many women were actually deceived, coerced, or uh, actually trafficked into uh, the service. She called uh, for higher standards of research integrity and transparency in historical studies. And to end my presentation on a positive note, uh, I would like to say a few words about the project that, uh, in my opinion, represents the most modern approach to applying Japanese studies in actual practice. Japan Lab at the University of Texas 
uh, at Austin combines Japanese studies with digital humanities by engaging students in, create, uh, in creating Japan-focused digital content, such as educational uh, video games. Uh, these resources are designed to make Japanese history, literature, and culture more accessible for global high school and uh, sorry for global high school and college educators. This initiative responds to increasing demand for digital teaching, uh, digital teaching tools, especially uh, in the post pandemic. By merging Japanese studies with technology, they actually have an actual lab there, uh, an IT lab. Uh, their projects uh, appeal to modern educational needs and enhance uh, learning through an immersive and hands-on approach. My personal favorite in this, you can check out their pages. It's absolutely great if you didn't know. Uh, my personal favorite is uh, called Ready, Set, Yokohama, which is an online game based on uh, Sugoroku. Uh, it's a Japanese board game. And this game lets players explore Meiji era Yokohama, uh, highlighting Japan's transformation as it entered globalized uh, trade uh, network. So this uh, concludes uh, my presentation, and I'm pretty much uh, and especially interested in hearing your perspectives about the situation in the UK. How do you how do you think about it? What should be done? What is not done or and should be done? And uh, I would like to hear a few words from you, uh, actually from the current state of future Japanese study, for the, for the future of Japanese studies, not just in the UK, but uh, in a global sense. And if you are interested in, uh, in uh, the footnotes of this paper, I'm actually working on a book project, book project that, uh, that uh, the main aim of this book project is to, uh, uh, to introduce uh, Hungarian Japanese early relations before, before the World War I in a global historical uh, uh, sense and in a global, glo and uh, I'm actually exploring it uh, globally. So there will be a lot of other uh, countries uh, included in this. And uh, this is actually uh, the, the status of Japanese studies is, is a short part of uh, the perception of, of, of a chapter about the perception of Japan in Europe and in Hungary. So thank you for listening and thank you for coming. So this is, I really wanted more people from the department to be here because this would be an excellent opportunity to think about what has happened over the last few years here at SOAS because we had very similar debates. So our previous oh. director, um, Baroness Valerie Amos, was very much of the mind that area studies had come to an end and that we now, that in a few years time, uh, every student will just study global liberal arts. And the idea was, and actually one of our colleagues in Japanese studies, uh, Dr. Angus Lockyer, was sort of tasked with that idea to, you know, create a, um, essentially sort of a pick and mix type degree. So you could um, you could sign up um, for an MA, for example, or a BA in Global Liberal Arts, and you could pick from the 500 courses that are on offer. You could, okay. and, and then put it together in any which way. Okay. Obviously, this well, it may appeal to some people, but, you know, what do you end up with? And it's exactly the same question. What is the yeah. disciplinary background? Are you just, you know, you have just a huge sort of compendium of different kind of knowledge that doesn't really fit together? Yeah. So under Adam Habib, our current director, it sort of there was a movement, or or maybe there was some more autonomy given to the departments to think about what does it actually mean to be an area studies department. And I, like Ike, who gave actually the first talk of the year in January, um, um, I'm an anthropologist, uh, but my background is in Japanese studies, so I studied Japanese studies in in Tübingen. So I'm very yeah. much sort of we we read Karl Florent, you know, and, and really. Uh, <laughs> Nauman and all of, of this stuff. So for me, it was very interesting to see that genealogy sort of coming together. But yes, let, let's hear let's hear from the room. I mean, what is what is our current approach to the idea of the area um, here at SOAS? We are an area study school. That was the idea to begin with. 
um, and that has obviously con colonial backgrounds and a colonial undertone. Um, so may I talk just a few yes, words about course. humanities itself? Yes. Just uh, one sentence, because uh, in Hungarian universities, as well, humanities are on the threat at the moment as well. So there are quite substantial budget cuts first from the government. And since I think uh, um, uh, um, Japan was uh, supporting Hungarian Japanese studies probably up until the 2020-ish, and it it's becoming less and less. Uh, but uh, for instance, uh, Japanese studies in the Czech Republic is quite good. I think they just uh, created a new Japan center, Japan uh, studies center, um, not in Prague, in some, maybe in Prague, I don't know. And in Romania as well. Right, yes, that's Carmen. Quite, Carmen quite strong at the moment. That's, that's, I mean, that's very interesting also in sort of the, the reg regional geopolitical and of course the, UA, uh, the EU context within which these things uh, happen. Shall, yes, shall we open up? Do you, yes, uh, uh, just start us off. Maybe it's, introduce yourself. So, yeah. So, East, used to be East Asian Languages and Cultures Department, but it's now merged with the other Southeast Asia, Asia, Africa Language Department. So, it's now Strudel Languages. Languages, Cultures, Cultures and, Linguistics. and Linguistics Department. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I mean, as you said, I think we are like humanities under threat too, right? In the UK. Yeah. Pretty much. And, um, and I feel like um, because the current director that uh, is more interested in global south, mm -hmm. so we're yeah. not really focused on. Okay. I don't know East Asia. Yeah. As it were. But um, I can tell you the current situation of Japanese studies, as in BA Japanese, is probably bigger than Chinese or Korean. Here at Sons? Yeah. Or in the UK? Yeah, yeah, so I know the number. It's like 96 students all together in the uh, UG. Mm -hmm. A little bit less Korean and less <laughs> Chinese. That's interesting. Yeah. Okay. But um, yeah, we attract both UG and PG students for Japanese studies, but Korean is more UG than PG, and China is more PG than UG. So it's, um, we're more kind of balanced, but yeah. But I don't know, mate. I, it, it feels like we're going towards East Asia rather than right. country specific because we used to have BA Japanese and BA Japanese studies and BA Chinese and BA Chinese studies. But these studies, they are bunched up. Merging. Yeah. Studies. Okay. Okay. So, so the same thing is happening. Yeah. Yes. yes. Anywhere else. Yeah. So that's the current situation. Okay. But um, yeah. Quite similar, I guess. But I don't know what's happening in light. The, the, you said it's At the moment, it's not decided. Uh, the last info I have is from probably the 5th of November. They uh, issued some uh, official note or something on their homepage. And uh, they wrote in that that they will be fighting for the department. But mm -hmm. there's little chance that anything can be changed because the... Uh, the Ministry of Education already decided to cut back uh, on uh, the support for for the Japanese studies and probably for. And the interesting thing, what happens in Hungary is that uh, they they don't really merge them as well. Uh, in in not really, they're not really merged at the moment in Hungary, but the Chinese studies is receiving quite enormous money from China. Right. And what the plan is to create a merged East Asian studies and use that Chinese studies for the other ones as right. well, because the Japanese uh, support is uh, barely uh, recognizable actually at the moment. And Korea is coming up as well. So, and actually we have it at two universities, we have some 200, uh, more than 200 students at the moment. While Polish studies, for instance, which is quite close to Hungary and more relevant, I would right. say, in Europe, we have one, what? one in the whole country. Well, I think that one student. Yes, that's uh, that's uh, 
this is interesting what's what happening with dynamics, yes. I mean, does anybody else want to come in on that? I mean, I, I have obviously lots um, to say uh, because we add to us, we, we, we fought off the challenge. There was an attempt a few years ago under uh, Andrea Cornwall to put everything together under an East Asian okay. um, sort of East Asian studies department um, under the direction of the China Institute. Mm -hmm. and China so Institute, that's, yes. that's what's happening at the moment. Obviously, we said that's a terrible idea because our funding is also depending on Japanese sources and they probably wouldn't be very happy to, you know, if we say, oh, you're now funding an East Asian department under. But the other problem is that the East, uh, the, the China Institute at SOAS is actually, I think I can say this um, here, is is uh, quite, um, it's, it's, it's not getting any funding from China mostly from Hong Kong, because the, the director oh, okay. has taken yeah. a very uh -huh. sort of a critical line of oh, China. So it's, it, 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 it's, which is very good <laughs> yeah. for us, but it doesn't work. So all the money goes to Sheffield, where uh, Chinese um, you know, investment uh, in academic courses is extremely strong. And so the oh, okay. Sheffield is actually now larger in terms of um, you know, uh, students and the concentration of academics in the East Asian uh, side, larger than so us. Uh, you know, it's expanding. it's expanding rapidly, but it only works through that. While on the other hand, and this is the problem with the Global South um, focus, is that essentially if we go to senior management and say, well, we want, you know, we want to have a stronger focus uh, on East Asia, on Japan. Uh, the argument is always, oh, but these are rich regions. So you just go and fundraise. Mm -hmm. And if you fundraise enough money, then we'll give you whatever you want. But you have to bring in the money yourself. Yeah. So we are trying to do that with students <laughs> hard work <laughs> and also very unacademic work and uh, it's, it's quite you know if you don't have in, in american universities you have specialist people to do mm -hmm. that and apparently it's all it's a kind of a grasp of the elbow so you're at the reception you have the academics talk how great everything is and then somebody grabs you by the elbow very gently and sort of leads you away into a separate room and say, here are the different options. You can donate 1 million or 10 million. And that, that's, we, we name a building, we name a school after you and so on and so forth. We have none of that. So, so maybe that's, um, yes, a future uh, career. Um, yes, <laughs> you're thinking well, of- For instance, that, Sainsbury yeah. is quite, quite strong, uh, no? Well, the Sainsbury Institute is um, at, is uh, used to be uh, here, partly it's now in Norwich. Um, it's affiliated with the UEA, and the UEA just yeah. cut down a massive part oh, of their okay. Japan, okay. Japanese studies program. SysTrack okay. is still doing okay, but the again, that's the problem if you you know relying on on sort of uh, on and the, and, the, and the endowment, of course, is going strong. Sainsbury is the supermarket. Sainsbury's. Um, but the, the 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 successors, both Lord and Lady Sainsbury, have passed away recently, and the children are not interested in Japan, so they probably leave things as they are. Um, so it yeah, it has, it's it's oh god, it's, it's such hard work, you know, to be very friendly to the right kind of people. Um, so the funding and that's that, and but. I don't completely disagree with that because the original idea of an area study school was that we take the money that comes in from the big courses like law and politics and we subsidize the smaller, um, you know, the smaller uh, specialties uh, like, um, you know, uh, what it, the classical German case used mm -hmm. to be called the orchid, the orchid. Um, uh, orchid uh, fast. Yes, <laughs> you know, exactly. Um, the orchid's a very rare, but, uh, uh, you know, in need of a lot of cultivation. But that consensus, of course, is now slowly breaking apart because within the, the sort of the power distribution with more power devolved to departments, so eco departments can make their own decisions about hiring um, how many people and so we are very much more flexible and we can literally on a yearly basis say oh we need somebody to teach this we can get a new person in but of course we don't want to give the money that comes in through the students uh, away to other departments mm -hmm. so there is a it's a very different kind of beast over the last 10 mm -hmm. years it's a kind of part of the neoliberalization of mm -hmm. higher education I would say. Okay. Yeah. yeah sorry but anybody else has particularly strong opinions on this, or what? What about the Japanese case uh, compared to? <laughs> <laughs> I 
But uh, sorry, even in Japan, there's there's two new global Japanese studies consortium or something like that. Uh, probably, yeah. So it's uh, the getting awesome. some kind of attraction. I uh, I would say global Japanese studies. There are, there's one consortium and there's a there's a new uh, inter university kind of. I don't know if it's an institution or something, but uh, there's uh, it's called. Yeah. Yeah, I think. Yeah, yeah. Probably. Uh, that, that's probably it was one a few years ago, I think. Yes. I I think I mean the the other thing, and that's because you mentioned Sir Peter Parker, and we just had last week the Sir Peter Parker award for spoken yeah. business japanese and sir hugh kortazzi um there is also there is a sense in which i think politically now the foreign office has gone in a very different direction we you have nowhere near the same caliber of people there nowhere near the same amount of knowledge um in these positions i mean I, I remember actually Sir Hugh Cortazzi gave one of the first uh, uh, JRC talks when I joined SOAS 10 years ago, and, and uh, he talked about uh, maps. So he was a former ambassador to Japan, but also he called himself a Japanologist. That's why I thought it was, it was very interesting um, to, to, to hear him sort of, you know, being part of this um, genealogy. By the way, his nickname at the Foreign Office with huge catastrophe <laughs> because whenever something happened, some small error in protocol, he would always say, oh my God, this is terrible. You know, if you have Japanese guests coming to the ambassador and you can't put the glass in, it's a huge catastrophe. So Hugh Kortazzi became a huge catastrophe in the house. It's a bit of inside knowledge. <laughs> yes, please. Yes. Um, the New memorandum of cooperation between the UK and Japan signed uh, this year or last year. I'm, I'm afraid um, I can't remember the date. Do you think um, one of the um, articles in the memorandum was talking about strengthening the relationship and in particular cultural ties between the two countries? Do you think this might? Uh, influence the way Japanese studies are perceived or supported in the UK is, or is this does not have any bearing at the moment, but might be something coming in? I mean, are you, which which memorandum of understanding are you referring to? The UK and Japan. Oh, in, oh, sort of the gen, well, yes, okay. Yes. Yes. Stating in terms of intensifying the uh, research, collaborate. Yes, well, uh, there was a bit of fanfare around the signing, but the memorandum of understanding is simply that it's non-binding. It it is it sort of lays out certain principles according to which the exchange could take place, but there is actually you know there's no guarantee that something will then actually happen. Uh, the problem with these is also that it's it was that one it was heavily science based, right? The idea was if we could 
get science cooperation. Mm -hmm. um, so scientists who don't speak Japanese, who don't know anything about Japan, would be funded to go to Japan to, to learn and vice versa. Then you would have some kind of knowledge exchange. But that had nothing to do. Obviously, that, that only applies to the natural sciences. And this is where much of the funding is going at the moment. Again, the understanding being, oh, these humanities people, they are so interested in their subjects. They will they will make an effort themselves, right? <laughs> and they will go by their own volition or they will raise the money themselves. So we don't have to really worry um, about them. So it's a good question, but I think these, well, actually, SOAS also has memoranda of understanding with about 250 uh, universities um, all over the world, but many of them are just dormant. You know, they, they don't really do anything. They could be the basis for something, but it needs somebody who goes there and says, okay, let's do something. Let's set this up in a proper way. And that requires a lot of energy. And, uh, I have a feeling that the engineering and all sorts of other disciplines were actually man uh, mentioned in it. Yes. Yes. It's rarely about the uh, humanities. Anybody? Yes. Um, I'm not sure if this is, is playing down the topic, but the, the kind of success of um, that you've just mentioned, the Japanese and, and Korean comparison to Chinese and other mm -hmm. and economically significant languages, is this not actually um, kind of proof of a very healthy investment in soft power? and the state of the discipline reflecting really what, what one can do on the kind of semi-periphery of, of global exchange. Um, and that the kind of, it, it might actually be symptomatic of, of the impact going beyond Japan studies into areas like science, a kind of uh, tip of an iceberg of interest in the area studies that is actually having its most important impacts not within the humanities, but elsewhere. And, and maybe the kind of debate which which we're having about the kind of uh, parameters of the discipline are just a part of kind of normal self-reflection that maybe you know other area studies would would kill to be in this position of, of debating the kind of healthy student numbers and um, considerate self-reflection which is currently um, kind of state of Japan studies. I mean, the, the example you showed from the University of Texas is, yes. is manna from the gods for anyone teaching. I love that. Project. Sorry, but I really love it. And uh, the good thing is that um, this is available for anyone. And uh, those students are doing something great, something that is practical, very practical, actually. And it's very engaging. Just try one of the, uh, those games. Uh, the Ready Set Yokohama game is just excellent, and you could, uh, anyone can learn a lot about the uh, the opening of Yokohama and and, and the, the history of Yokohama. So I, I love that, and I think uh, in in certain countries they are trying to to marry digital humanities and Japanese studies. It's not always really working, but it's kind of. Uh, um, gaining traction, I think, uh, lately, but it's absolutely remarkable. I love what they are doing at uh, Hosting, so that's absolutely brilliant. And your point was actually spot on, so that's that's quite true, what's, what's happening at the moment with the uh, fight between uh, different uh, East Asian departments. But, and uh, what's happening, and it's quite inevitable, I would say, that they will merge everywhere uh, into a big, but that's that that has good parts as well because you you will have, for, for instance, in Jap in the Hungarian Japanology, and I'm using Japanology here because it's not really a social focus, social studies focused uh, thing in Hungary. It's much more uh, philology focused, translation, literature, stuff, medieval literature. Haiku is quite big in Hungary at the right. moment. And uh, and uh, what's happening is that what happened in Hungary that they were not really seeing what their sinologists uh, sinologist uh, colleagues are doing, what the Koreanologists are doing, what, what what is going on at the moment in Chinese studies. They didn't know anything about that, and it was just a door next to them, you know. 
And it requires these departments to work more closer right. together, which is good right. in itself. Which would follow from the critique of the silo, you know, yes. the mentality that you often have. Yes. 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 Thank you. Um, apologies if this is somewhat combative my question. Um, I'm a bit of an imposter here, so I'm not a student here. I'm here okay. to interest. Um, I am a special, this comes back to your question about all your friends about the foreign office and the people you tell those roles. Um, I myself am not a diplomat. Uh, I'm a policy advisor and strategist that runs I uh, advise ministers on legislation. Okay. Um, I previously though, worked uh, advising Japan on the restart of international travel during the COVID uh, pandemic. I was the person who negotiated with them the bilateral agreement to restart travel. I have then since applied for jobs in the Foreign Office. Now, this isn't true of all of the roles that do go available, but I agree with you that they were interested more in whether or not I was a career diplomat than any of my interest or knowledge in the subject itself. And then further to that, I've since lived in Japan, and the majority of people I know that live there and still do live there, they don't go there through Japan studies or technology. They tend to be software engineers, engineers, mm -hmm. which I myself, yeah. or they were working some sort of very specific science, yeah. or they will just have a language skill. So my question is, does your field of study and academia as a whole have more of a responsibility of really trying to sell what Japan studies does offer? Because in all honesty, I, as an outsider from industry, point of that term, I only know where it is because I have an interest in it. And I think the skills that industry could use that are really good that people who study this have, we just don't really know what it is. Yes, that's a good that's a good one. Uh, I would say it's hard because I'm only uh, I I have knowledge about Hungary. I don't know the situation in the UK. But what happens in Hungary that it's basically manga and anime studies, right? And I'm not against it. I just don't really understand what they are doing. And the other thing is that this is definitely not something that the industry, any kind of industry would want. And um, yeah, I don't know what's happening in the UK or in the USA at the moment. In the USA, actually, actually uh, the situation might be quite different because in the UK, you had um, language officers, military language officers, and they, who were actually used in uh, during the, the war. And the same is true uh, for, for the US. But in Hungary, it was a totally different uh, thing. And um, yeah, um, so that's why I, I don't really think the more you going eastward in Europe, the less relevance it will have for the industry. There will be, of course, there will be uh, specialists who like uh, go into one uh, special direction and they they do the the Japanese studies course uh, or they do an MA or a PhD in Japanese studies in Hungary or outside of Hungary as a Hungarian there are a lot of Hungarians uh, probably at Oxford and and, and in Cambridge but uh, yeah so I, I I'm not really sure if if I look at Hungary I don't really see how how these uh, Japanologists uh, could be of any use. For any type of thing, but maybe, maybe the pop in the pop cart in the, I don't know, I don't know. Well, yes, we have avoided going down that route, although actually, yeah, sorry, you know, there's a bit of an idea, right? <laughs> yes, well, we, we, the, the idea actually, you know, uh, the outgoing of Professor of Art History actually suggested that at the end, like, well, just get somebody young in to teach anime and manga, make it really big courses, very popular. And then we in the background can offer our normal, you know, small science um, specialized teaching about the atonal qualities of the 16th century music. And, you know, uh, go on about the obscurantism, <laughs> yes, um, very niche things. Um, and that, I think that's one way of thinking about it. So following the popularity down to its um, logical conclusion. Um, we do have courses on popular culture, which are very popular, um, but they're not, they're not quite that yet. The danger of that, of course, is also that, you know, things can change very quickly. And what, although, I mean, the, 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 the anime contingent is quite significant. Yeah. I mean, my students, Austrian students, advanced Japanese, say they get into Japanese studies because of anime. 
measures. Right. And it's also a generational thing, right? You yeah, have to yeah, teach the Rani yeah. people, then used to be the martial arts people, and now you have the anime manga people. They all have very different ideas and very different sort of needs, perhaps. So it's quite interesting uh, to follow these different but generations. Let's say martial arts. It can be used in military, you know, well, for battles and stuff. <laughs> okay. It could actually be. More, more I'm sorry. More anime than manga, right? Even, even, even that. Yeah. In Hungary, there's a little change. There's a paradigm shift, kind of, because uh, now I think uh, K-pop and uh, Chinese pop culture is getting more, gaining more traction, while the the J-pop is not that right. uh, popular uh, at at the moment, as it looks like. Right. So yes, that would be the thing. If you're too reactive to what's just, you know, um, happening at the moment, of course, that's also quite risky. I think the first chair of professorship for anime and manga studies started just one or two years ago. Yes. I think it was, where, where was it? In Canada? It's a, it's a, yeah, I think so. I, it's a, or in the US? It, I think it was in, in Canada. Canada, yes. I think it was immediately yeah. back as the, the ultimate Mickey Mouse degree. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Right, okay. Well, thank you very much. We've thank come you. to the end of our time. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, please give a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please, 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 please give the people online. I'm so sorry for those attending online. Um, I completely um, forgot uh, uh, to talk to you. Uh, thank you for attending. Um, please come back in two weeks' time where we're talking about the de-whitening of international education in Japan, a talk by uh, Dr. Akira Shah. Um, and then we have one more event with Abigail Magdalene um, on the eye-opening ceremony of the great uh, Buddha uh, at the Todaiji. So something more uh, international education followed by something very Christmassy, I would think, a more ritual and uh, music and performance. So thank you very much for coming. And thank you.